One of the best legacies of the ancient world is the Roman aqueducts. Ancient Rome's main waterways were called aqueducts. They brought fresh water from the mountains into the cities to make fountains, baths, and drinking water. Before the Romans, aqueducts had been used by the Egyptians and the Indians, but the Romans were the first people to make them so significant. Across the whole Roman Empire, the Romans built over 200 aqueducts to bring fresh running water to their many cities. Having a water supply became a status symbol for the empire, showing how advanced and well off it was. Now the question is, how did Roman aqueducts work? The Romans achieved a regular and shallow slope over the area by installing underground pipes and creating siphons. This allowed them to transport water in a constant flow. Workers dug winding tunnels and constructed networks of water pipes to carry water from the lake or basin that served as the source to the city of Rome. This was accomplished by transporting the water deep into the ground. However, when the government provided adequate cash, lead pipes were utilized instead of concrete pipes to create the pipelines. In most situations, the channels were constructed out of concrete. The valley had to be crossed by the lines. Therefore, the construction team buried a siphon beneath the surface of the ground. This siphon was built into the ground in the form of a large depression and it was designed in such a way that it allowed water to descend at such a rapid rate that it gained enough momentum to proceed uphill. Siphons are an integral part of the system that is responsible for the flushing actions of toilets. The expense of siphons was another problem. For them to work correctly, the water had to be forced through lead pipes, increasing the water's velocity and price. As a direct consequence of this, arches were utilized. These are the features that the great majority of us have come to associate most strongly with Roman aqueducts. As a result of this, the arches were deployed. When siphons were not an option for bridging the valley, archways were constructed instead. This was done when the first solution was unable to be implemented. The conduits were organized in such a way that they went along the tops of the arches in the structure. To filter the water at several points along the journey, sedimentation tanks were installed at strategic spots throughout the route. Access points have been carved into the system in certain other portions so that people responsible for maintaining the pipes may get to them. The engineers made it easier for workers to perform maintenance by positioning two tubes next to each other and directing the flow of water so that only one of the pipes was filled with water at any given time. This made it possible for one of the pipes to be full of water at any given time, which made it easier for workers to perform maintenance. The employees could enter the pipe one time at a time as a result of this. The ancient city of Rome had 11 aqueducts constructed between 312 BC and 226 AD. Many of these aqueducts were responsible for bringing water from Tivoli, which was around 70 kilometers away. The Anio Novus aqueduct was the longest of all the aqueducts. Its length was around 60 kilometers. It was also the most important aqueduct. When ancient Rome was overthrown, its structures, including its aqueducts, were obliterated. By the time the Goths arrived in 537 AD, significant parts of the water system had been eliminated because they were no longer required by a population that was decreasing annually. This was the case because the people had reached a point where it was no longer large enough to require them. The Goths were the ones that brought about the final stage of the system's collapse, which included the obliteration of any aqueducts still standing. However, during the time of the Renaissance in Europe, Rome started reconstructing its aqueducts to supply water to all the new fountains erected throughout the city. This was done to keep up with the growing population of the city. By the time the 1950s rolled around, Rome had already reconstructed eight of its aqueducts, which are still in operation today. At the height of Rome's dominance, its network of aqueducts was able to supply more than 1,000 liters of potable water each and every day to every citizen of the city. That is much more than what many of today's systems for delivering water are able to supply. Romans took gravity into consideration. The ancient Romans constructed their aqueducts in such a way that they sloped downwards from lakes and springs. This enabled gravity to fulfill its job of conveying water across large distances. 
Years of land surveys, land management, and planning were required in order to ensure that the water could travel at the appropriate speed. If the water moving at a speed that was too fast, it would erode the stone. And if the water moved at a speed that was too slow, it would enable the water to stagnate and become undrinkable. Neither scenario is desirable. Instruments such as gromas, corobits, and dioptra were utilized by Romans to ascertain the land's topography. This ensured that the water would move throughout the system at the optimum rate regardless of location. Although the Romans occasionally made use of pressurized siphons in order to enable water to move uphill, they were considerably more likely to shift water supplies to sloping land even if it was many miles away. Their arch-shaped bridges, which were multi-tiered, covered the valleys and water flowed across the top of the structure, which was exposed to the air. The Romans were master builders and their characteristic arched bridges were designed to support the maximum amount of weight feasible. It all took almost under the ground. Although all that is left of Rome aqueducts today are the massive stone arches and bridges that were once used to carry water over the ground, the Romans also constructed intricate pipe networks that ran below ground so that water could pass without being seen. This allowed the Romans to conceal the passage of water. In point of fact, the above ground bridges did not make up more than 20% of the entire aqueduct system. The ancient Romans buried their aqueducts to protect them from the effects of erosion and to ensure that the surrounding countryside and communities were not significantly impacted by the construction of the aqueducts. This allowed the Romans to build the aqueducts without disrupting the natural environment. Construction of the underground pipes was a complicated process. In order to dig extensive trenches into the ground, the Romans were made to toil non-stop during the day and into the night. After that, they filled them with clay to prevent water from escaping through any cracks or gaps that may have been there. Clay pipes were used to transport water all the way from the highlands to the city, which was a journey that was often as much as 50 or 60 kilometers downhill. These pipes were buried underground. The Romans obtained this pristine water from a spring in the area and stored it in a vast reservoir that they called a castellum. From here, the water was conveyed through pipes made of lead with a smaller diameter to secondary castella, and from there, it was transferred into pipes with an even smaller diameter that led directly into fountains, baths, and your own private dwelling if you were extremely fortunate. In order for the Romans to keep an eye on what was going on below ground, they built manholes and shafts that provided access to the complex underground systems that they were building, both while systems were being built and after they were completed. This allowed the Romans to monitor what was going on below ground. Stone, brick, and volcanic cement were the principal building. Pazolana is a form of volcanic cement that the Romans used to construct aqueducts and other buildings. The building material was created by combining this cement with stone and brick in the appropriate proportions. Because of this marvelous and innovative substance, Roman aqueducts could remain so durable. It is also why many of those aqueducts are still standing now. While positioning the rock, brick, and cement, the Romans also made use of wooden structures comparable to the scaffolding we use today, which they would subsequently move. In other words, the Romans compared these constructions with the modern superstructure. That's it for today. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel for more interesting videos. Thanks for watching.